Now, modeling linear association. So this is where we talk about all our scatter plots and everything to do with scatter plots. So when we talk about scatter plots, it's really, really important that we understand that they are used in everything and they are just the best way of modeling data. So whenever we can use a scatter plot, we will choose to use a scatter plot. You will notice that when you watch the news, when you read a paper, anything like that, scatter plots are everywhere. So how do we come up with a line of best fit? So a few things, we take the residual. So as you can see here, you've got this line of best fit and you've got all your little dots here. So least squares line of best fit. What does the least squares refer to? The least squares refers to the distance between these. So the actual data point and the line of best fit. The distances between those actual data points and the line of best fit are all added up. And we say, what line, so using all the different lines we can possibly put there, what line makes the least distance between the actual data points and that line? And that is the least squares. So, and those, that distance between the data point and the line is referred to as a residual. And that's really important. So it's referred to as a residual. So um, we then make sure that our line of best fit um, line minimizes the sums of squares of the residual, which is essentially just saying that the distance between the actual data point and the line of best fit for each of the points added up, it's the smallest number we can get. And that's what a least squares line of best fit means. Yeah. Um, it works best if there's no outliers because outliers would then skew all of that. Now, what's really important is that sounds really difficult. It sounds super difficult. It sounds like something you're not going to be able to do easily. So what's the best way of doing it? The best way of doing it is doing it on your calculator. Or if you're given the right pieces of information, doing it by hand and we'll discuss that. So a least squares regression line or a least squares line of best fit matches this much as this here. Now, a lot of you will have seen a line that looks a little bit like this before. This is exactly the same. They have just replaced M with B and C with A. And really important, they've put the A in front of the BX. It's a very minute detail. It doesn't actually change at all how the line operates. The line operates exactly the same. There is no change to how the line operates. But you have to do it. You need to make sure you put your C slash A, which is your y-intercept, before you put your gradient and your x variable. Really, really, really important that you change that up. I know you're all probably used to y equals mx plus c, but you just need to flip it. That's just reality. It's just a very minute, silly detail that you just need to persist with. Um, Make sure you're entering the variables in the correct order. The classic variable, a classic V card trick is to give you the Y variable before the X because usually the X goes before the Y and you always look at explanatory first and then you look at the response. Sometimes V card will do the opposite. They'll give you the Y, so they'll give you the response variable and then they'll give you the explanatory variable. They're trying to trick you. You need to just make sure you double check all this information before you use your calculator or answer a question. So, so there are two scenarios to this. These are the two scenarios. I didn't want to go through this in too much detail because I'm sure you've all been through this in super limited detail. Now, I don't know why this diagram goes away, but nonetheless, you've got the general line of best fit. The two scenarios are one, you are given the raw data. You need to use your Casio. So I'm sure you all know how to do this by now, but you go to your spreadsheets, you put it in your spreadsheets, you go to linear regression and you select linear regression. And once you've selected linear regression, you go forward with it. I'm sure you've all done that multiple times now and I don't need to go through that in detail. Um, so I'm not going to. Again, it's slightly different on the two Casios. I personally have always used the white Casio, the class pad, because that's what I used in high school and that's what I've tutored with. Um, but I know a lot of my students in the past have used the TN Inspires, which are the, the black one with the smaller screen. Um, again, you can do it on both. You just use spreadsheets. There's no difference. So you're all on top of it. Now, the other point with this is then, what if I'm given statistics? I'm not given the raw data, I'm given statistics. I'm given things such as the R value, the, <coughs> pardon me, the, <coughs> hang 
got something stuck in my throat. <coughs> the standard deviation of X, the standard deviation of Y, the X mean, the Y mean. Therefore, you are going to use these formulas here. Now, super, oh, I didn't mean to draw through it. Super important here. These are not given to you in the exam. You need to have these in your summary book. These need to be in your summary book. So again, another non-negotiable thing, you need to have these two formulas in your summary book. I've even explained down here what each of the things mean. So R is your Pearson's correlation coefficient. S, Y, and S, X are the sample standard deviations of Y and X respectively. X bar and Y bar are the sample means of X and Y. Now, what I mean by sample is that it's like, it's the standard deviation of Y, of the Y values. So we've got the Y values and we did our own sort of linear regression to ju or just like calculations to our Y values and we got the standard deviation of the mean. We then did our X variables and we got the standard deviation in the mean. And really important that you know that it's just of those, it's not of the whole set of data. So it's just of the Y's and it's just of the X's. So you know, S, Y, S, X, X bar, Y bar. Now you need to calculate B first for obvious reasons. You need B in the A calculation. So you do B first, get your B value, and then you can go Y equals A plus whatever B is like, you know, 3.2 X. Then you calculate your A, you find A is four. So you go Y equals four plus 3.2 X. And you've got your, you've got your equation. So non-negotiable, that needs to be knowable good. Your summary book, sorry. Another non-negotiable page, <clears throat> um, you will be asked in your exam, I can guarantee it, to interpret either the y-intercept A or the slope B. You'll be asked to interpret it. What it means by interpret is to discuss it with words, discuss what is going on. These are the two sentences you use. The first sentence is for the slope, the second sentence, uh, sorry, the first sentence is for the y-intercept, the second sentence is for the slope. So if you are asked to describe the y-intercept, you will say the y-intercept is whatever a. So the orange means you're going to manipulate that, you're going to change it. So whatever a is, let's just say it's two. The y-intercept is two, and then what is the um, what is the the units? Because you may be doing age versus height. So think about it age let's say in years is going to be your explanatory variable your y variable is going to be we'll do height and we'll do it in centimeters and that is your response variable now it makes sense it makes sense your response variable is going to be height because your height is not going to justify your age your age is going to justify your height so what we say is that <laughs> sorry the y-intercept is, I don't know, it could be 20 centimeters. 20 centimeters, let's just say it's 20. This means that the y variable, which is age, is 20 centimeters when the x variable, you'd actually probably, to be honest, you probably don't even need, if I'm honest with you, you don't really need the units here. You just say that the y-intercept is 20. This means that the y, so this means that the age is 20 centimeters when the, no, sorry, this is the height. God, I'm having a little bit of a, since that cough, I'm having a little bit of a, a mind blank. So the y intercept is 20. This, this means that the height is 20 centimeters when the age is zero uh, years old. So that's how you go about that question. Now, Let's say the slope here is 15. So you gain 15 centimeters each year. So you'd say B here is 15. So the slope is 15. This means that the height, and now it's positive 15. So it's going to increase. You're not going to write increase slash decrease. You're going to choose one. So you're going to choose increase by 15 centimeters for every one year increase in the age. So that's how you go about that question there. And that's how you go about these questions now. It's really important you have these two sentences written like this with different colors to show where you need to manipulate it. So obviously there also, you need to use the word increase if B is positive and decrease if B is negative. Um, and you just replace the, replace the word. So really important, these two sentences are another non-negotiable. So you need to use them. 
Then what we have is another non-negotiable, which is the sentence to describe our R squared. So our R squared is our coefficient of determination. This tells us what extent of X is caused, uh, sorry, what extent of X caused Y or what extent of Y is caused by X is probably the better, better way of saying it. So it's, for the example back here, it's saying what extent of the height, what percentage of the height is explained by the age. It's like a data calculation for it. Obviously, it's not going to be perfect, but it's a way of us using maths to say, hey, what sort of percentage of our height is actually going to be manipulated by our age? So we say the coefficient of determination tells us that R squared times 100%. So R squared will be, so back in that past example, it was 0 0.97. So you'd say it's 97%. 97%. Um, and we'll say this is for our age and height of the variation in the height is explained by the variation in the age. So this gives us our sort of sentence to describe what's going on with R squared. So if you are asked to talk about R squared, this is the sentence that you will produce. You will use this sentence right here. So R squared will always come out um, of the calculator positive. That's another thing that's important. Um, we can tell if it's truly positive or negative by observing the scatter plot or the gradient. So important. Now, quick little point as well is residual plots. Now, residual plots, I'm sure you've been through them by now, but just to quickly note on them, residual plots are where we have data. Let's just say it looks like this. And it follows a line like that. Now, what's really important is that when you then go to graph this residual plot, what you're doing is going, all right, this here is going to, so my X here is going to stay the same. The X and the X stay the same. That axis will stay the same. The Y axis changes to residual. So the Y axis here was whatever your Y response variable was. It now becomes residual and you essentially plot it according to how big these differences are. So I'm plotting it on this graph and it looks somewhat like this. And then you sort of connect the dots. Like, you know, you make like a, like a thing like that and you can connect the dots. Now you don't have to connect the dots. It just sort of helps out sometimes. Just one of those things I like to do sort of help it out. But what's really important is with a residual plot, what you can tell is whether your data is linear or not. So, what you can say is when you plot out your residual plot, if it looks something like this, or it looks like this where all the data points are on the line, well, if all the data points are on the line, it makes sense that your data is linear because it's literally gonna look like this. You draw a straight line through it and it covers all the points. That's clearly linear. Now, if your data looks like this and it's like a mess, there's no real pattern to it. You also have linear data. You're happy that this original data here was linear. That's what you're saying. If your residual plot is a mess, it tells you that your original data was linear. You're happy with that. It's not perfect linear. It's like, you know, but it looks like that. And that's clearly linear data. And it looks like that. So you're happy with that. Cool. Now, what if your residual plot forms a pattern? What if it forms a little curve or it goes like, you know, like this or something else, or it goes like this. You can even have a residual plot, sorry, that looks a bit like this. That looks linear in, in sense, like that's a, res, that's a residual plot we're looking at there, and that looks linear, but that's a pattern. And because it's a pattern, it tells me that my original data is nonlinear. So if you get a pattern of any sort, it tells you that your original data is nonlinear. And that's really important. So if your residual plot forms a pattern and the only pattern that's accepted is, is this pattern here, um, if it forms any other pattern, your data is non-linear. So the only time you're ever going to really need to use this in exam is to interpret a residual plot. They give you a residual plot like this and then they ask you to interpret what's going on and you say, there's a clear pattern to it, thus telling me that the original data is non-linear or there is no pattern to it, which tells me that the um, original data is linear. Cool. That's all you're going to need to talk about with these. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, just let me plug that up a bit because it's charging in my iPad while I used it. Shut the lights off. Awesome. So,